Hello again and welcome back to the Day of Daily Bible Study. We're going to continue on with the Gospel according to Mark. Today we're going to be in chapter 4, starting in verse 1, but we're going to do something a little bit different today, and, and I'll explain why. Uh, we're going to read a passage, we're going to leave a couple of verses out, and then we're going to continue on. And the reason why has to do with something that Mark does, I'll explain all in a minute. But we're going to come back to that passage we've missed, uh, we skip over uh, tomorrow. Before we do, let's pray. Uh, loving God, we thank you. Uh, help us to understand what Mark is doing. Help us understand what Jesus has to teach us and help us to appreciate uh, the literary skill that these gospel writers have. Help us to see everything that is there and not only that which is on the immediate surface. Lord, watch over us as we spend time together for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Mark does this thing. Mark's not the only person who does this thing. It's, this is not something that he invented. It's not a thing that is only characteristic of Mark. But there are several places in Mark uh, I think we've seen this in some others, where he does what you could call, they call it the interpolate, interpolation technique, or uh, easier to think of it as being a sandwich technique, where what he does is he'll take one story and, and he will divide it into two. And in between those two, he will put another story. And the general sense is that these two stories have something to say to each other, that they're not really two different stories, that they are, they are meant to be read together. And so while I am going to read one of them today and then look at the next one, the other one tomorrow, um, I want you to realize the fact that that's just out of necessity because otherwise it's too much to talk about at one point. Uh, but that we are, are, we are going to be looking at both of these together and seeing what's going on here. So this is a parable. There's, there's a parable um, and then we're going to read the explanation of the parable. We're going to skip over an interchange with his disciples and we're going to come back to that tomorrow because it's extremely interesting. So starting in chapter 4, verse 1, uh, we, this is what we read. It says, He, again, this is Jesus, began to teach again by the sea. And such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down. And the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and he was saying to them in his teaching, Listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And he was saying, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. As soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But though... Sorry, I should realize that these are some of the verses I'm going to skip over. So the who has ears, let him hear. And then we skip over, actually, to verse 13. And we'll get this, you know, 10 through 12 tomorrow. Uh, and he said to them, uh, Do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones who are beside the road when the word is sown. And when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. In a similar way, those are the one, these are the ones on whom the seed was sown upon the rocky places, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then, when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones on whom, on, on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And those are the ones on whom the seed was sown on the good soil. And they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold. Um, sorry, I, I, I lost track from where, where I was reading, but um, this is a fascinating passage. And, and what I want to highlight for you, because again, part of these points is not necessarily to repeat everything that you've heard a million times and that is so common as to be no longer noteworthy. Um, I do want to address just what the meaning of the text is, but I also want to highlight the fact that this is a parable that needed explanation. And, and so if you, if you put yourself into the position of somebody who was following Jesus, part of this crowd, there were so many people who came up to Jesus, and he gets himself out on a boat so he has a place to stand, and he's kind of like a natural amphitheater as, as things come along, and, and Jesus tells a story. And if we only look at the story itself, we're going to look at how Jesus interprets it, we have, um, we have Jesus says, there's a farmer, he's sowing seed, some of it lands here, some of it lands there, some of it lands there, and that's the end. And that's when people leave. Um, that they don't get to hear the rest of the explanation. If we can hear this parable and know exactly what is meant, it's because we've heard the explanation before. Um, that it's, it's, we have to remember that it would not necessarily have been completely obvious to whoever happened to be there, and that the disciples didn't know what the parable meant, and they needed to have it explained. So I want to highlight, first of all, the fact that um, 
the parables are not necessarily, and this is by, by way of tomorrow, the parables may not be as much to clarify as it is maybe to, uh, to make a division in people. And we'll talk about that more tomorrow. So I kind of want to look at these, these three, these soil types, because that's kind of the main point of the parable. And we'll come back to the other kind of bigger uh, questions about what does this mean for the church uh, tomorrow. And so what we have is, so Jesus talks about that there's the word, the, the sowing of the word. It goes, the planting of the word is going everywhere, almost indiscriminately. Today we have precision planters and all the rest where we can really get um, pretty well be sure that generally speaking, one seed will yield one plant. Um, in these old times, you just, you do the best you can, you dig up the dirt, you make a place for it, and you just scatter the seed, and you hope for the best. And, and I'm sure that there's people who got better than other people on this, and that they were more efficient than some others were, uh, as there always is. But, the general, but to, by today's standards, this is just very indiscriminate scattering of seeds. But the point is that the variable that's going on between all these things is not the sowing of the seed. It's not the word. The word is going out to all. It's intended for all. Uh, there is nobody who is, um, you know, Jesus does not talk about a kind of soil that does not receive the seed at all. You know, there is no soil that has not been at least given the seed. What happens to the seed is different from soil to soil, but there is no category of people in this case uh, to whom the word is not intended to go out. Uh, we can have. A, we might even say that that you know theologically we are forced to conclude that everybody actually does receive the word. I don't know if we can go that far or not, but there's a way of reading this parable that that leads us in that direction. But regardless, there is definitely no kind of soil from whom the seed is withheld, uh, and I think that's important for our sense of the of the universal intent of the gospel, of going out to the whole world and not saying, well, this group of people, they don't get the gospel or they get a different gospel or something like that. It's the same seed, no matter which soil type we're talking about. And so you have some on the path, you know, that the, the idea is the word comes and they're, they're hardened. They have hardened themselves and they are not able to receive um, that. And so it gets picked off, you know, by others. Uh, interestingly, interestingly, um, when, when birds uh, eat seeds, Sometimes they don't always get digested all the way through, as I understand it, and that they, uh, they, they get fertilized out into some other places and can grow there, which is an interesting idea as to what might that mean, uh, if anything. Uh, the second one is about this idea that they were put on, on rocky places. Uh, and, and this is fascinating. This is something where I had to really learn uh, in my experience talking to farmers. Uh, because uh, as, a, as, a, as a city boy growing up in the suburbs, I, I didn't understand this because it said uh, it grew up, it grew up spr- sprang up quickly because there was no depth of soil. And I didn't understand why the depth of soil had anything to do with it. And, and a farmer explained to me one day, he says, oh, no, this is very important. There's a reason why we plant seeds where we plant them because we don't want them to grow until there's enough heat in the ground to sustain them. And if you don't plant the seed deep enough, uh, then you might have a couple of warm days, but before there's been enough warmth and enough consistent warmth for it to grow, and it could spring up right away because it thinks it's time to grow when it's not. And that was fascinating because that was what you know, was troubled me. It's like, why, why does this have to do with this? And it explained to me that actually Jesus was, was absolutely correct. This is a thing that happens. And so what that means is that, um, you know, that sometimes you can have, when I was in high school, I, I go, there were people who, they, they had a profound conversion experience and they had this great transformation and they got real excited about going to church and all the rest. And that was, and on the one hand, you're glad for it. On the other hand, it always felt weird to me a little bit. And especially in the years that have gone since then, because um, several of those people who I knew who had these pretty dramatic conversions in high school have since kind of dropped away. And, and I think that part of the thing that one of the angles for at least some of them might be this uh, story here where... Um, the, 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 cert, the seed was planted. It went into the soil. It wasn't, re, it wasn't rejected uh, like it was with the people on the path, you know, but, and yet it didn't go very deep. And it's precisely because it didn't go that deep that people respond so quickly, so overtly, so, so, uh, with so much initial promise. And yet because there's not the depth, because there's not the root, because it's not buried deep inside the person, uh, it's subject to the scorching of the sun the, and all the other environmental issues. Um, and then there's also the ones, there were some on thorns. You know, there's so many competing interests, things that distract us, things that get in our way. Uh, we allow uh, the good to get in the way of the great. You know, we allow good things to be, you know, we talk about oftentimes, you know, oh, kids are involved in so many things these days. And part of the problem is, you know, which makes this difficult, I mean, is that uh, the choice that's being offered to kids oftentimes is not, will you go to church or will you do heroin? Uh, the question is often, will you do, will you go to church or will you be heavily involved in this sport team? And there's any number of great things involved in sports, you know, where you can learn about teamwork and, and discipline and all kinds of things. 
so it's actually precisely because the other alternatives are good in so many ways that they can be dangerous if we allow them to totally choke out our faith. Um, but that's one of the things that makes it complicated because it's, it's we want to say make a good make the best choice, and we may disagree on what the best choice is. Uh, but the last one is this one is you know it's good soil, and what's fascinating about it is it doesn't say. Uh, some of these that landed on good soil just kind of grew up and replaced themselves or, you know, whatever, or just enjoyed the life of the plant. The purpose of the plant, the purpose of the harvest is to uh, make more. And it's important, I think, to realize the fact that while not every plant that grows from the good soil produces the same amount of fruit, um, we read that every seed that lands on the good soil does produce fruit. And I think that is um, a challenge for us because um, especially if we define fruit relatively narrowly as this idea of sharing the gospel with others and helping to create more Christians, um, do we, are we living in a life where there's constant generation, constant passing on, constant bearing of fruit, or have we maybe helped one person, maybe just our children, and have that be it? Um, And that, I think if we interpret that very literally, this idea of each one of us needs to produce 30, 60, 100 new disciples, I think that that is a huge challenge for us, Um, especially because most of us, and I'm included in this as well, uh, have not made anywhere near that many kind of personal disciples to a certain degree. But it's a challenge, and regardless of whether that's meant absolutely literally or just the fruit that we live in our lives, um, you know, it's a challenge to say, this is what what good fruit looks like. And if if we're not going to be hard-hearted, if we're not going to be, you know, shallow, if we're not going to be the kind of people uh, who, who let, you know, the ways of the world choke out the Word of God in our lives, then it means to be about the business of, of bearing fruit. And, um, and it's, a, it's a calling for all of us, I think. And so I encourage you to, to think about that. Um, there's so much information in here, and, and we could talk about it some more, but uh, I, I think this is the kind of thing that I want to encourage you to think about what it looks like in your life. And uh, we're going to come back tomorrow and look at those things that Jesus said to his disciples Uh, in between the parable and the explanation. So that's all for today. Come back in tomorrow. We'll continue on with more of the gospel according to Mark. Have a good day.